This lesson is about uh, kingdom protista. When we talked about the kingdoms, when we learned about classification, we talked about definitions of each one. And the definition of the protista is, as we said, it's kind of the catch-all place, like the, like the drunk drawer in the kitchen. It's where you put everything that doesn't fit someplace else. So the definition of a protista is a eukaryote that is not an animal, plant, or fungus. This kingdom has many diverse organisms in it. Many of them, if not most of them, are unicellular. <coughs> a few are multicellular. But, uh, there are also some that are colonial and just lots and lots of different variety in this in this kingdom. There are three major groups of protista, the animal-like protista, which are heterotrophic. Um, they are often called protozoa, which means first animal, and they're classified into groups based on, the, on how they move and their type of locomotion. The second group, the plant-like protista, <coughs> are autotrophic. They have cell walls or some kind of cell covering, often made of cellulose, but sometimes of other substances. They have chloroplasts, they undergo photosynthesis, <coughs> and there are two main groups, so the plant-like protista, the unicellular ones, and the multicellular ones. And the third group is the fungus-like protista. They are also heterotrophic. Some of them are saprophytes, some are parasites. Saprophytes means that they um, live on dead and decay material, and like fungi, they secrete enzymes to digest or break down the, the surroundings and then absorb the nutrients. That's what they're fungus-like. They do not have cell walls made of chitin like fungi do, but they do have centrioles, and examples of these are slime molds and water molds. So let's look first of all at the protozoa. There are four main groups of protozoa uh, based on their type of movement or lack thereof. First of all, the, the ones that move by pseudopods. A pseudopod is a fa means false foot, and these are the amoebas. They're kind of like a blob that just kind of oozes from place to place. A pseudopod is a temporary extension of the cytoplasm. Um, that pushes the cell membrane out and they just kind of move forward like that. They use their pseudopods not only for movement but also for eating. They will surround a food particle with two pseudopods and then the pseudopods will um, fuse together and form a food vacuole containing the, the food that, they've, that they're eating. The second group is the flagellates. The flagellates um, move by means of one or more flagella. A flagellum is a long whip-like structure, somewhat like the one you saw in bacteria, but these are more complex and a lot bigger because these are much bigger cells than bacteria. Flagella, uh, a flagella are made of uh, an arrangement of microtubules, and uh, they move kind of in a spiral fashion to act more like a propeller than anything else. An example of a flagellate is Giardia, which you can get from drinking stream water without, without being purified, and it causes a diarrhea-type illness. The third group is the ciliates. They move by means of cilia, which are short hair-like structures, similar to flagella in structure, but they're much shorter and much more, uh, there are many more of them. Uh, they can move together like oars uh, on a ship. And an example of a ciliate is paramecium. And the fourth group is the sporozoans, which generally do not have a method of locomotion. They are all parasitic. An example is plasmodium, which causes malaria. Here's a diagram of a typical um, ciliate paramecium. Uh, you have a diagram similar to this in the packet that you received in class. So let's just talk about a few of the structures here. Um, you see all the cilia around the, uh, around the edges here. Uh, realize, of course, this is a three-dimensional structure, and so those cilia cover the whole outside of it. It kind of looks hairy, if you could look at it. Um, and uh, if you just see the exterior part, but those are the cilia. Just underneath the surface, inside the cell membrane, are trichocysts. Trichocysts are uh, little poisonous barbs that can be ejected. Uh, they're a means of defense for the paramecium when it's being attacked or when it's something else is near to kind of warn off um, other organisms in the area. There's an oral groove, which is a depressed area there that has a line with cilia that form a current that pulls the food in. The food collects in the gullet here, and then it'll pinch off to make a food vacuole, and you see numerous food vacuoles in here. The anal pore is a place where undigestible um, materials can be ejected from the cell. The, the paramecia, the ciliates in general, and a, a number of other of the protozoa have contractile vacuoles. Since they live in water, they often take on excess water, and a contractile vacuole allows them to collect the excess water and then expel it from the cell. And so what it actually does contract, it, once it fills up with water, it contracts real quickly, squeezes out the excess water, and then collects it again. In the ciliates, you oftentimes see these feeder arms that feed the water into the... the um, Contractile vacuole, this one has two, and the, the ciliates, or the paramecia in general, usually have two um, contractile vacuoles, one at each end. 
there are two nuclei in the paramecium. There's a micronucle macronucleus and a micronucleus. The micronucleus is kind of like the reserve copy of all the genes. The macronucleus has multiple copies of the chromosomes. This is kind of the working copy of the chromosomes. These are single-celled organisms. They do not have specialized cells to do different jobs like your body does. They have to do everything in one cell, and they're very, very specialized cells, and they have lots and lots of different things that occur within that cell. And so it makes sense that they would need multiple copies of the genes, of the chromosomes, in order to do all those different jobs. Next, we have a euglena. You have a diagram of euglena in your... Uh, in your packet. It's a little bit different than this. Yours is facing the other direction and it shows things a little bit differently. There's an eye spot in Euglena. It is not an eye. It detects light in your picture and it is at the other end and it's kind of like a little dark oval with little light spots in it. <clears throat> uh, the eye spot allows it to detect the presence of light and move into the light because it has chloroplasts. In your diagram the chloroplasts look kind of like little football helmets and the chloroplasts undergo photosynthesis. The euglenoids are a group of organisms. Not only are they are they photosynthetic, they can also they're also heterotrophic. They can eat other things if there's not light available. Here's a nucleus. They also have a contractile vacuole. Yours in your diagram looks more like the contractile vacuole of paramecium. They have two flagella, a longer one and a shorter one, and they're used for movement, and one of them is used kind of kind of like a rudder to choose the direction. Um, the plant-like protist um, undergo photosynthesis. Remember, photosynthesis requires chlorophyll and often some other pigments as well to trap the energy from light and use it to split water and uh, provide the energy to put the molecules together to make the sugars. They're very important because they are the major contributors to oxygen in the air. If you think about it, or, uh, although trees are very important to using carbon dioxide and producing oxygen, Earth's about 70% covered with water, and so it makes sense that you would have a lot more uh, since there's so much more surface area covered with water, then you would that the algae and the phytoplankton would produce a whole lot more of uh, the higher percentage of the oxygen, and that's the case. <coughs> phytoplankton are unicellular algae that float in the ocean, and they are the base of, of aquatic and marine food chains, just like grass is the base of most food chains on land. There are unicellular algae, which include that euglena we just looked at, plus uh, other organisms like diatoms that have glass shells, dinoflagellates that are bioluminescent, that means they give off their own light in the water, and they're multicellular algae that include kelp and seaweed, and we're going to look at some examples of these. Here we have a number of different kinds of unicellular algae. These are diatoms. There are lots of different glass shells in different geometric shapes. Um, very, very intricate looking, very, very interesting to look at. These are some colonial um, unicellular algae. Here we have some um, dinoflagellates up here. This is a colonial algae called Volvox. That each one of these little, little dots here is a separate cell that has two flagella, and they the flagella work together to move it around. And the green circles inside are baby colonies that will be uh, once this cell gets too once this colony gets too big to support itself, it'll break open and release the baby colonies. And this one is is one called Chlamydomonas that is also a flagellated uh, um, algae that has two flagella and it moves through the water. Sometimes algae can overgrow and produce something called an algal bloom. This is by definition a rapid overpopulation of algae. It often occurs when there's an increase in nitrogen in the water. This can occur as a result of runoff from fertilized lands or from sewage in the water that produces a lot more nitrogen. Plants and algae love nitrogen because it allows them lots of um, nitrogen in order to grow. They need nitrogen to make proteins and, uh, and grow. And so oftentimes when you have a lot of nitrogen, they're going to grow like crazy. That's what happens in the springtime when you put fertilizer on your yard and the grass starts growing like crazy and turning really green. It's because of the nitrogen in the fertilizer. This can cause an overgrowth of algae in, in a pond, for instance, and that can be harmful to your pond because once they can, if they continue to grow uncontrollably, they'll use up all the nutrients in the water and then they'll start dying. And when they die, they'll, their decay will use up the oxygen in the water and kill the other things in the water like the fish. So if you have a bloom occurring in your pond, you need to do something really quick to try to prevent um, the continued bloom and losing your fish as well as other life in the water. A red tide is a special kind of bloom. This is a bloom of dinoflagellates. Here you see a picture of a red tide. The dinoflagellates actually give off a toxin 
in the water that can kill fish and make the foods from the water toxic. They can also be harmful to you if you're in the water when this occurs. And so if you're in a fishing village here along the coast of this and you see this red tide coming, you're going to be pretty upset because your fishing is your main source of income and it'll be a while before you can fish. Even if it kills the fish and they wash on shore, you can't eat or sell the fish because they're harmful. Now the multicellular algae are, are often called seaweed and they these are algae and not plants. They're still in the kingdom of Protista. They're not plants because they don't have vascular tissue. Plants have tube-like tissues called xylem and phloem that allow water and minerals and food to move through the plant. And these algae do not have those. The seaweeds do not have those, so they are not true plants, which is why they're considered part of the kingdom of Protista. There are three main groups of multicellular algae, the green algae, the red algae, and the brown algae. They all have chlorophyll, which, which is necessary for photosynthesis to occur, as well as some other pigments. In the green algae, you have both unicellular um, and multicellular or, um, algae in the green group. Some of them are also colonial, like that volvox we saw just a minute ago. They live in groups. Uh, the multicellular ones would be like green seaweed, like ulva, which is called sea lettuce. The red algae, also, they're red because they also have a pigment called phycobilin. Uh, this allows them to live at deeper depths in the, in the water. They don't, um, the, as the light enters the water, the water slows the, the light down, and the most energetic wavelengths of light are going to be the ones that are going to penetrate the deepest, and those are the red, I'm sorry, those are the blue and the purple uh, wavelengths of light. The red ones are the, have the least energy, and so they're going to be filtered out first. And so the the uh, algae that grow the fight the red ones do not need the they do not use the red wavelengths of light, and so they can reflect red in the phycobilin pigment. The brown algae also have a brown pigment called fucoxanthin, and this includes the giant kelp and sargassum. Sargassum is the type of seaweed you see washed up on the beach at Galveston. Um, these can live in the water, also on the top of the water. Um, and they're found worldwide. Here's some pictures. Here's a red algae. The red algae often grow at a deeper depth, like in a reef formation. Here's the green algae. This is the sea lettuce ulva. This is a giant kelp, and these, these uh, round structures here are called bladders. They're filled with air, and they help keep the stalk um, vertical in the water. And this is sargassum. This is the kind that you see washed up on the beach at Galveston. If you notice, it has little berry-like structures, too. Those are also bladders that are filled with air that allow it to float on the surface. Now, algae is used for lots of different things. There are lots of people and animals worldwide that use algae for food. Uh, but there are also derivatives of algae that can be used for lots of different things. The auger that we use to grow bacteria in in, in lab is made from an algae extract. There are thickeners used in ice cream and other foods. Things like bluebell ice cream have thickeners and emulsifiers that come from algae products. So there are lots of, lots of different uh, food products that are based on algae. And that's good because it's very plentiful around the world. Um, algae and some algae, multicellular algae, undergo um, a, a typical pattern of development called alternation of generations. We'll see this pattern over and over again as we look at different organisms um, in the in the living world. They have an alternating. They alternate between a haploid and a diploid phase. Remember, haploid means it's got one copy of the chromosomes, and diploid means there are two copies of all the chromosomes. So what we have here is a diploid sporophyte. The sporophyte plant. It's, a spor it's not really a plant, but we'll call it a plant. The sporophyte algae here is diploid, and it produces haploid spores. So meiosis occurs here to produce the haploid spores. Spores can grow into either a male or female gametophyte. The gametophyte is the <coughs> gamete producing part of the life cycle and at a certain point they will produce the, the haploid gametes which then are shed into the water and can meet up and fuse together. When they fuse together they make a diploid zygote which grows into the diploid sporophyte. So meiosis occurs in the production of the spores, all other cell division that occurs here is going to be mitosis for growth, for production of the gametes, and so forth. And then when you have the fusion or fertilization take place, the fusion of the gametes to the zygote, then that's going to be the diploid phase will grow into the sporophyte, and the meiosis occurs there to produce the spores. This is a recurring pattern. You'll see lots and lots of lots and lots as we move through um, the different kingdoms and phyla as we look at the animals and plants. 
Um, lichens are another thing we talk about when we talk about protista and fungi. They're a symbiotic or association between a fungus and an algae. These are, uh, you often see these growing on rocks or trees. They're oftentimes pioneer organisms, the first ones to grow in areas where there is no soil. Um, the, the, al the fungus part uh, can attach to rock or the, whatever the surface is it lives on and provide a, a place for the algae to to collect and to be held. They can collect, the, the fungus part can collect water. The algae will collect sunlight and produce food for itself and the, and the uh, fungus part. And so they are a very um, well-defined mutualistic symbiotic relationship. The fungus-like protists include slime molds and water molds, and they're pretty unusual. We don't see them very often at all. Most of the fungus-like protists are saprophytes. That means they absorb nutrients from, from dead organic material like leaves and wood and things like that. Slime molds, um, you don't, we don't see very often in our part of the world, but they often live in, in uh, damp, forested kind of areas, and um, you'll, they are very bright colors sometimes and very, very unusual. Water molds are also uh, fungus-like protists. Um, they are saprophytes in water and also some plant parasites. If you've ever had a fish die in your aquarium um, and it starts growing the little fuzzy stuff here, that's going to be a water mold. A water mold, a particular kind of water mold, also caused the Irish potato famine in 1846. So most of the slime molds and water molds are decomposers and recyclers of nutrients. They help produce topsoil in some, some um, occasions and some of them are also parasites of plants on land like the mildews and blights that you find with grapes and tomatoes. Now there are a number of diseases called by, caused by protozoa. An example of one is amoebic dysentery. This is caused by ingesting amoeba in unclean water and it's a vomiting and diarrhea kind of disease, very unpleasant. Malaria is a disease caused by plasmodium and malaria is carried by the mosquito. And then African sleeping sickness is another one that's caused by a protozoan called trypanosoma and is transmitted by the tsetse fly. Let's look at the life cycle of plasmodium. Here we have a picture of plasmodium um, and some blood cells to show you, to show you the organism in the blood. Um, this goes through a, a life cycle that involves two species, the human and the mosquito. And so when the mosquito bites a human and injects the, the sporozoites, the form of plasmodium that it injects, the sporozoites travel through the bloodstream to the liver and there they cause, they grow, and they insist in the liver cells and start growing in the liver cells to produce another form called the merozoite. When the merozoites are produced, they enter the bloodstream and then they infect red blood cells where they reproduce inside the blood cells and once they produce the um, gamete structures, the blood cells break open and release the gametes, which can then be picked up by another mosquito. Inside the mosquito, the gametes fuse together and produce the um, sporozoite, which then migrates to the salivary glands of the mosquito so it's ready to be injected into someone else. Malaria is a disease that has recurring bouts of fever and chills, very high fever and, and violent chills. Uh, it can make you feel terrible and the, and the fever and chills repeat every couple of days, three to five days, depending on the species. This is the point in time when you have the fever and chills, when those red blood cells are opening, because that's going to cause damage to your cells and that's going to stimulate a fever response, which is one of your body's responses to try to, to ward off infections. Very, very nasty disease. Another one is African sleeping sickness. This one, called trypanosoma, has a flagella, so it can move around, even though it's a sporozoite, a spor, a sporophyte, sporozoite. I'm sorry, and uh, but it also is is a disease that can cause fever and chills and eventually coma and death. Um, it's not. It's found in Africa, in parts of Africa. It's carried by a fly called the tsetse fly, and is transmitted by its bite, similar to what we saw with the malaria. This concludes notes on Protista.